conduct our studies on the biblical doctrine of the church, ecclesiology. And we have been following this under the eight marks of the New Testament church. And uh, when we identify where we are, you'll realize that it might seem a little bit drawn out, but we are progressing. We are not where we started. We started at the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, then we looked at the membership of all believers. We looked at the criteria. We look at the responsibility of church members, et cetera, et cetera, and the membership. We look at leadership, that God has appointed, uh, appointed men to lead his congregation, his flock, and that he has laid down qualifications uh, for these individual, and for these individuals, always in plurality. And we finished that, I think we spent about 10 sessions on that leadership in the church. And uh, tonight we move on to the other mark of a New Testament church, that of relationship within the church. This is one of the marks that I'm very passionate about. Of course, you have heard me say that about all the marks. All right, that's okay. <laughs> relationship. After we finish that, we're going to move on to fellowship of the saints. Then we move on to discipleship. And after that, we do workmanship. Why? What is God's purpose in saving you and leaving you on earth? Leaving us down here. We'll talk about that, the workmanship. And then we'll finish our studies on the worship of the triune God, according to the scriptures. So let's look at a good definition then of relationship. Relationship is a link or is a link between people, persons, which demonstrates itself in unity, connectivity, identity, responsibility, and mutuality. We use this definition before with membership, remember, because of the connectivity we share. Now we are using the same definition in the context of our relationality within the body of Christ. Let's remind ourselves of Ephesians chapter 4 and the verses that tell us something about our connectivity or relationship here, one body. Now, this is instructive, you know, saints, because the church is one body. That's why we have one head. Now, you see the problem with denominations, and each de denomination would have an individual head. That's a major monstrosity in the body of Christ. Because if the church is one, and the church is one, the one that is the body of Christ, it has one head. He is the head. That's why brethren historically would never set up a headquarters, not only because of the dangers in it, but the fact that that is anti-body. Every denomination have their own headquarters. From whom then and where is the church going to get her instruction? For us, it's from the apostles whom the resurrected Christ appointed and revealed himself. So this one body is important as we talk about relationship. It's not like some of us belong to one body and some belong to another body. And it's so important that we get the fundamentals of this. And not only we have one body, but one spirit. It is very interesting that we know this, that by one spirit were we all baptized into the body of Christ. That is so powerful, saints. It's not a different spirit. It's the same spirit of God that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that brought us into this body. Everybody came through the door. Nobody entered into the body of Christ through a window or through the roof. It, one door and only one. He's the door. And the spirit brings people 
through that door, which is descriptive of salvation. So one spirit, one hope. It's interesting, though, sometimes we are not as together as we ought to be on this, that the ultimate hope is to see Jesus and to be like him. He's the ultimate one. We shouldn't be sharing different hope when it comes to life. Some people, some Christians are hoping for a better human government on earth, better Medicare. All those are social hopes. That's going to be dashed against the, 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 the stone. The Christian's hope is beholding Jesus. We shall behold him. Job said, who mine eyes will see and not another. And because of that, we have that hope. And that's what sustains us. We, with all our differences in personality, in experience, in tolerance, we're different. God is a God of variety, but we are galvanized and held together the fact that we have one hope, and that is to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And then one Lord. This should foster everything else because we're following one master. Paul said, follow us as we follow Christ. We don't want to be a competitive leader. We don't want people to be saying, I am of Cephas, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. We want to say we are pursuing and we are following the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. And one faith, one faith. And that has to do now with not the faith we exercise that brought us salvation, but the object of our faith. Christ died for sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and, and he was raised the third day, according to the scriptures. Th those are basics of our faith that everybody can relate and should be able to recite and confess. I'll probably share with you some time ago, uh, last year, actually, I was at a conference in one of the assemblies here in the city and listened to a dear brother um, rendering a song. I'll just show you how songs when they are properly selected and rendered how powerful they are uh, is as if i'm still hearing the brother i don't know the title of the song but i'll give you a description the lyrics of the song paint the picture of a scene in heaven of people gathered there from different parts of the earth different stages different ages and they're all answering the question how did you get here? And like a choir, everybody responded by way of the cross. How did you get there? That man over there that was crippled who lived on that bridge. How did you make it here? By way of the cross. The decent, well-groomed, polished politician is in heaven. How did you get here? By way of the cross. The professor who taught at the university, Ivy League College. How did you get here by way of the cross? Awesome. Heaven is going to be awesome because that response in itself is going to be a masterpiece that the angels will be awed when they listen by way of the cross. One of you songwriters should perhaps write a song under that title. One baptism. One baptism. Now, this is very, very clear. And I hope we understand this. It's not talking about ritual baptism. How, well, how do we know that? We don't have one baptism. Some people were baptized in river. Some baptized in a pool. Uh, some baptized in different places. Some believers are not even baptized yet. There are saints in glory who are never water baptized. I hope we understand that. We don't believe nor preach baptismal regeneration. Water cannot give anyone salvation so there are people who perhaps didn't live long enough between personal faith in christ and then to be able to undergo the ritual of water baptism but they are gloriously saved how why are they saved this one baptism spirit baptism which unites us in christ 
the spirit of the point that when we believe we move us from Adam, as in Adam all died. He removed us from condemnation and places us in Christ, united us with him. All of us enter into this body, one body, through the same way. This is awesome. One baptism. You see the amount of time the concept of one is stated because it wants to communicate relationality. We are connected. One God and Father. No, that's the one that I love. The last part of the final one. Not just one God, but one God and Father. That's why we say brother and sister around here. I share with you, I'm pretty sure. I'm going to share it again. A brother who is with the Lord knows somebody that Brother Oliver knew quite well. Ashley Smith. Very humorous brother, had an amazing sense of humor. And the people always accused us of resembling one another. And so we were both at a conference and somebody decided to walk up to Brother Ashley and myself. We're good friends. And the young woman said to us, tell me something. Are you two guys brothers? And Brother Ashley is quick on the jaw. He said, yes, and started to, 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 to smile. And the, the young lady said, no, 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 no. What I mean, do you have this same father? <laughs> she said, of course. How, how else are you going to be brothers without the same father? And the girl persisted. No, no, no. I want to know if you're blood brothers. He said, yes. We are saved by the blood of Christ. And she just could not get around Brother Smith. And every time I think about having the same father, how we rush to defend earthly blood connection. How we will not withhold anything from our siblings on earth. When it comes to church, my brothers and my sisters, we can't say the same thing. I want us to be thinking about this, you know, because this is serious. The Bible said that this brotherhood, this family, this relationship should be revered, cherished so much that we should be prepared to die for the brethren. For brother, that is a tall order. But most of us will find it easier to die for a flesh connection when we had nothing to do with it. Really, I like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5. Henceforth know we no man any longer according to the flesh, not even Jesus of Nazareth. And that's why I don't refer to him. I don't refer to a Lord as Jesus of Nazareth at all. He's the Lord of glory. I don't even refer to him as Mary's boy child. He's the Lord of glory. He's the King of Kings. We forgot that he came down. He's coming down. It's not traced to his mother. He left the splendors of heaven. And so we realize that what Jesus has been exalted to all about his father. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him. And that's our brother. You see the connectivity again, the different points of connection. He purchased us, he's our redeemer. He's our brother, he's our friend. He's our example, he's our Lord, he's our master. You know what? He's everything to me. That connectivity we have, saints, is unique, is precious, is heaven designed and executed. The camaraderie we have and the relationship, there's no rival, nothing like that under the sky. Nothing. We need to begin to talk some more and brag some more about that. That's my brother in the Lord. Oh, that's my sister over there in the Lord. Oh, yes, 
we need to revisit that. Relationship then within the body, the family of God. All believers are connected by membership within the body of Christ. And you remember when we look on the membership, it's personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are connected. We are not independent. Another thing we're going to talk about. No one in the body of Christ is independent of the other. Just as how no part in the human physiology, in the human body, is independent. And I often call attention to this right here at Bethel Gospel Chapel. The fact that there's a reason God, God didn't put eyes on, on your toes. Because they function differently. Your, your toes don't need their own eyes down there. All the toes need to do is to transport the body, give, give it stability, and stay in the body. As long as the toes stay in the body, they don't have eyes, but they don't lack vision. See what I'm talking about? Now, what I just mentioned about vision, that is the idea of Christian fellowship, which is coming up when we finish relationship. How God designed the human body that even though the, the, our feet don't have eyes down there, they are not without vision. Th that is awesome. And he's going to use spiritual gifts. Even though you don't have the gift of evangelism, you still know how to lead somebody to the Lord. You're not without the knowledge. So if you are somewhere one day and somebody is dying, you don't run to the church to look for a brother, look for brother Moses or somebody else. And so come, somebody's dying, please come lead them to the Lord. No, not because we are not evangelists by giftedness. We, the evangelists have taught us how to lead somebody to the Lord. So this is important again, that connectivity that equip us and make us thoroughly equipped. In Ephesians 4, he talks about that, equipping the saints for the work of ministry. We are one in Christ Jesus, for by one spirit were we all baptized into one body. It's amazing. And that's why the enemy cannot cope, defeat the church of Jesus Christ, because we are connected. You might worship at a Baptist church, you may worship at an AME church, you may worship at a Pentecostal church, you may worship at an Anglican or Episcopalian church or a Methodist church. But if at all you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, where the Spirit of God place you, unite, united you with all of us, we are not hmm. anymore in the body because we are brethren. No more than those others who have been exercise faith in Jesus Christ. And that to me is amazing. Sometimes when we look at the fading and the dwindling mem membership in our, our assemblies, I don't want us to use that assessment that is very much correct to think that that is the true picture of the church. The church of Jesus Christ into which we are baptized is a triumphant, victorious body. Undefeated, cannot be defeated. But we must call our members to a sense of awareness, connectivity, and responsibility as we're going to see. Let's look at a passage over in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 4. There were diversities or diversities of gift, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God. By the way, did you recognize the triune God? Isn't this amazing? Let me read again for you. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. There are dif differences of ministries, but the same Lord. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God. Wow. 
that is, I want you to pay attention to that because there's a triangular connectivity, relationality within the nature of God, spirit, son, and father. And we are going to learn from that connectivity in a moment. So the same God who works all in all, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Powerful verse. We're not going to touch verse seven in exposition tonight, but I'm going to prepare you for it when we deal with spiritual gifts. Because there's a tendency in the church today Church Universal, I think, where these televangelists and Bible teachers and pastors, somewhere along the line, they have been misled, thinking that their gifts is given to them for them to build empires and to, for them to build financial powerhouses. No, read verse 7 again quickly. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. That's where I learned the concept that my teaching gift is not for me. It's not given to me for me. It's given to me for the profit of you all. I don't benefit. I don't grow on the basis of my gift. I grow when I listen to others, not when I speak. That has been the downfall of televangelists and preachers around the world. They thought that they are independent. No, the most gifted Bible teachers and preachers around us must take time to listen to the ministry of the word. They do not grow. We do not grow when we speak. We grow when we listen. Faith cometh by the word of God, and it comes by hearing. Huh? It doesn't come by speaking. That's why the Bible says, how can they hear unless they are what? Sent. But I'll get back to that. Very, very important that we guard ourselves from effect for being from being effectively used by the Spirit of God, and then to erroneously conclude that we are independent. No minister is independent. The more the Spirit of God uses you effectively, is the more you are dependent on the ministry of all. Otherwise, you are going to be either burnt out are you going to fall down we need one another that's the idea we need one another we need the prayers and support of those who can't even say a sentence clearly in public but they're laboring on their knees in prayers and in case some of you don't know that that's the secret of my ministry I didn't make it. I didn't develop that. But God provide people right here who are committed to praying for myself and family and ministry. Because the, the more we are used effectively, the more the enemy targets us. But we are not scared. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And guess what? I'm not alone. I'm covered by brothers and sisters who are praying, who understand the dynamics of spiritual warfare. And so we are not intimidated at all. We are not scared. And Paul said that he pressed towards the mark. He says, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same spirit. D did you observe the phrase that is repeated in all of them by the same spirit? You notice there's no reference to the Lord Jesus Christ here. There's no reference, reference to the Father here. Because you see, the Holy Spirit 
is the one who administers and issues spiritual gifts. Now you go in some circle and you hear people asking the father to give them spiritual gifts. The Bible tells us right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11, that the spirit of God gives gifts severally as he wills. It is the spirit who equips us with spiritual gifts. By the way, that's why they are called spiritual gifts. They fall under the domain of the Holy Spirit. That's exclusively his ministry based on what Jesus promised when the spirit comes and the nature of his work. So it is the spirit of God. And that's why when he came on the day of Pentecost, spiritual gifts were not only given, distributed, but effectively displayed like tongues. Unlearned, untrained men spoke with eloquence and everybody heard in their own language. When the spirit is given liberty, when we recognize his power, that we need his power to articulate what we have, then let me tell you, we stand amazed. The people said, aren't these men speaking Galileans? You, we have to understand the culture to understand that statement. It was one of amazement. The accent that accompanied these men was a Galilean accent. But the eloquence and the clarity doesn't fit Galilee. Because Galilee was not bilingual. It was a city that only spoke one language. You see why the people were amazed? But they recognized the accent. Just like you, you, you can't hide a Bajan accent, at least not from me. Every different culture, you have accent. The way they say things. And I, I well, moving on. Some accent we just love. But I said, but no, aren't these men Galileans then? If they are Galileans, how come every man hear the language, the message in their own language? And in processing this phenomenon, that amazed them. Listen to the explanation. They're drunk. <laughs> See, when the natural man are face to face with spiritual, the display spiritual power, he resort to natural explanation. And I just love, Peter's my guy. I just love what Peter said. We are not drunk, as you all know. For you, if wine were being served, you wouldn't be hearing us anyway. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Said this does nine o'clock in the morning. You, you guys all know you drunk got know what time the wine is going to be served. What is the display of the Holy Spirit right there? Started with notice the rhythm. There's a rhythm in the passage to another, to another, to another. And I'm going to talk in a minute about, about that word another. There's something very important here that I want us to get as we talk about relationship. Something that is confusing among Pentecostals or they have caused it to become confusing. Here is what it is. In Bible days, based on this passage and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the person who is given to whom the gift of tongues is given that person is never given the gift of interpretation. The same person who speak in the unknown language is not the same person who interpret. That is the epitome of confusion. Notice the rhythm to another. Why? How are you going to get objectivity if Brother Moses gets up, speak in a language we don't know at Bethel, and then he... You resort to let me explain. That's not how the spirit did it. The spirit would equip brother Moses then to address us in a language that we don't understand with a message. And then the spirit would raise up brother Oliver now instantaneously to interpret what brother Moses just said. Objectivity and genuineness requires that is somebody else. It's right here to another. To another, to another, never the same person. Today, 
in the so-called tongue-speaking churches. We don't even bother anymore, even to attempt. We don't even attempt to fake interpretation of tongues. They don't do it anymore. Everybody is just excited to be in a place speaking gibberish of which nobody have a clue, but they are excited about it. Their tongues are loose and they are exercising, they are perspiring, they are even throwing some amen, hallelujah in there and people are worked up. And in a lot of churches, I just call it a Sunday gym. Ain't going anywhere above the sky because God requires of us when we address him, we should know what we are saying. In fact, that's when right here tonight, the various brothers who prayed, after they prayed, people say, Amen. Can you imagine Brother Moses getting up and praying in German? At what point would you all say, Amen? Well, you would know. You don't know German. You would know when he's at the end of the prayer. And yet that's what they practice. Paul said, if somebody comes in and hear you do that, wouldn't they say you're all insane? He actually says that. So this connectivity and relationality comes with responsibility. And then he continues. Notice this. He says, to another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues. Stay with me. To another interpretation of tongues. I didn't even remember I have the verse here. The one to whom the gift of tongues is given to speak is not the person who carries the gift of interpretation. You can't fake that. Let me explain that word another because, because it has everything to do with our subject matter, relationship. We are connected. It speaks volume in that passage where Jesus promised the disciples that when the spirit comes, what he would do. Let me read this for you. If you love me, he says, keep my commandment. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another. See that word, another comforter. Now, the word another here in the Greek is alos. Okay, there are two words in Greek that are translated in English with the word another. And you are not going to know which one is in the Greek because they use the English word another for both. But it's an interesting distinction because when Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but I'm going to ask the father and he's going to send you another. Alos means of the same quality and nature, having the same attribute and essence. So guess what Jesus is saying? You guys are not really going to miss me. For I'm going to send you one just like me, but he's going to be spirit. When the spirit comes, you won't be able to hug him as you hug me, for I am in a body. But when the spirit comes, this is an amazing thing. So listen to this. Whatever Jesus is, the spirit is. Not, not only because of the Greek word used, alos, of the same but it means the spirit of God is a person. The spirit of God is a divine person. Jesus said, I'm going to send you one just like me. As opposed to the other word that is called heteros. This is interesting. This is the word that we get our English word heterosexual from. Heterosexuality of a different kind. That which involves a male and a female. See, marriage is, biblical marriage is heterosexual. You can't have two of the same. That's confusion. And the, plus, they cannot fulfill the purpose of marriage. I mean, that God gave back in Genesis. We look at this before. So you have, here you have these two Greek words then. Heteros and alos. 
it the two of them even get better in Galatians 1 and verse 6. The new King James does a better job in explaining to you and to let you know they are not the same Greek words in the passage. It does a better job than the old King James Version that uses the English word another twice, even though the Greek words are different. Look what Paul said to them. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who call you in the grace of Christ to a different, the new King James correctly introduce a word that you get what the Greek is saying. Remember, heteros mean different. One male, one female. So you, you, you turn to a different gospel, he continues in verse 7, which is not another. It's not one of the same kind. It's not allos. Wow. You have left that which I gave you to a different one that is much less than what I gave you. And then he said, but there are some who cause trouble and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. That's when people came up with the idea, you have to keep the Sabbath to be saved. You have to keep the Mosaic law. You can't eat pork. What? Yeah, people who believe that. Dietary laws, they are corrupting, perverting the gospel because the gospel they preach is another of a different kind, less quality, not of the same essence. Powerful use of the two Greek words here in Galatians chapter 1. And so when the Bible says to another, no, we are dealing with connectivity. So I'm going to close off just by reminding you the basis for our connectivity and relationship and relationality within the church. We have a similar birthright. Our spiritual birthright was produced by the Spirit's baptism. It's interesting that we could recall, I recall the brother who placed me under the waters of baptism. Some of you may not even remember because that's not important. That didn't bring salvation. But we all know that when we believe the Spirit of God, puts us in the body of Christ, united us with Christ, and the Bible is going to call us in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Our spiritual birthright. The believer's spiritual ability. Boy, we want to be talking about that under, under spiritual gifts. That every time things don't go right at your church, and you criticize it ne negatively, you are disabling your ability. When you walk into the sanctuary, the church building there at Bethel, and when you walk in and you see bits of paper on the ground, and you say, wait a minute, let me walk over to the board and see who is on duty. And then you get upset about the, about the place not being ready for worship, etc. You just disable the divine ability God has given to you to bend down and pick up those papers and help prepare the place for worship because you're a believer, priest. Priests don't complain about the absence or disruption of things. Priests prepare for place for worship and prepare himself and herself for worship. Another time, another place, we'll talk about that. The believer's spiritual calling. We all have a spiritual calling to contribute to the spiritual body of Christ called the church. Bethel is not just a building where we come together. It, it, there is, is a spiritual entity that we don't see with the natural eyes. Somebody needed to remind us right here. It's the gathering of a group of people who have been blood bought, spirit baptized equipped not only to worship but to do warfare with the enemy spiritual calling <laughs> spiritual the believer's spiritual responsibility mm -hmm. as a priest we are to stay more in touch with the high priest he's in heaven 
Use prayer to vocalize your observation. Use prayer to communicate your frustration. Tell God about it. Be candid with him. He knows that your heart is already frustrated. You, are, you need not come Sunday morning with a man-made fake accent when your heart is not right with your brother or your sister. God already knows that's fake. That's theatrics. That's hypocrisy. You can do the right thing. As priests, we fix things and we make things right. And then the believer's spiritual empowerment. Did you know you were equipped to speak words of power and encouragement into your brothers and sisters who are overwhelmed? Oh, yes. The devil doesn't like when we speak words of encouragement to one another. When we are overwhelmed with life struggles, whether health, financial, or family issue, marital issue, we need to know the power of encouragement, encourage one another, exhort one another. Oh, yes. The enemy don't want you to know that. The believer's spiritual engagement. Bethel is not going to reach optimum performance and experience if we discover that you only relate to people who share your personality, your nationality, or your carnality. If we respond spiritually, I'm telling you, you think Bethel performed well under the direction of the choir by Brother Warrell? Try when we come together with the difference of personality and concern and when we are spiritually engaged. Henceforth, no, we no man any longer according to the flesh. Whether you are Bajan, Jamaican, or you're Guyanese, or you're Canadian, has not to do when Bethel is gathered. It's a spiritual entity. We are to relate on the spiritual level. What you see is not what we have. We have something far more powerful than that. The Spirit of God. I could show you from Genesis right to Pentecost. When the Spirit of God takes over a church and engages that church on the spiritual level. Uh huh. And everyone will hear the message in their own language. The believer's spiritual engagement. The problem with us today in the church, we are fighting spiritual battle with carnal weapon. We are using weapons of the flesh. We might use our money or lack of it. We use our education or lack of it. Paul says you are just carnal. Raise the bar. We were spiritually born again. That's regeneration. We are to grow and relate to one another and a spiritual entity. So guess what? If the brother is old and the sister is young, has nothing to do with age of the body. It's the agelessness of our spirituality. Age to age, you are still the same. El Shaddai, El Shaddai. The believer's spiritual engagement. And finally, the believer's spiritual service. Only priests can serve at this level where you take things to the Lord in prayer in your closet. Not in the podium, not on your feet when you pray in public, but in your closet ministry. You talk to the Lord in your own language, in your own terminologies. That's a time when you don't have to have the subject and the verb of your sentence matching. You talk to God. He ain't nobody else's business to you. And trust me, God knows your language. God not only knows grammar, he knows grace and he supplies it. Oh, Father, we just want to thank you tonight for this session here and relationship in the church. We are connected. You connect us the moment we were regenerated by your spirit. You change your identity by your spirit, by baptizing us into the body of Christ. We are not the same. We'll never be the same. 
we were not designed to be the same. Could you help us to understand that when we address you as our father, we are acknowledging connectivity with others who are bowed in your presence. We thank you for Bethel, where we are gathered together from time to time in a physical building with our physical bodies. But remind us tonight, our gathering there is much more than bodies in benches or in chairs. It's a spiritual gathering of your people who you purchase at an awful cost. Remind us, remind us that when we are assembled, we have connectivity. We have service. We can call in heaven support and artillery. When the enemy comes upon us, we can dial heaven. And we thank you when we call on heaven, there's no press secretary to say, hang on, because you're busy. We have access to you. What a difference. No call waiting, no busy signal. What a blessing. What a relationship. We say thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Amen.